Hi, welcome back to Oak Haven. Uh, one of our videos we posted, we had a commenter who commented on a plant that was growing in their yard, uh, a grass that was seeming to, to uh, spread across their yard, and uh, uh, I assume that it was this grass that we're, we're going to talk about today. Um, this is a, a grass, an invasive, that, uh, that has become the one that keeps me up at night. So what we have here is Japanese stilt grass. Japanese stilt grass is an annual grass that uh, we never saw in our property before. Um, and then we've started to see it in the last few years, and I don't know if it's just because we've become aware of it or if it actually is becoming more prevalent. It's been in the United States. Uh, it was first discovered in the United States in 1919 in Tennessee. So it's been here for um, over 100 years, but like a lot of <laughs> high Kimber. So we're gonna our our new uh, way of treating stilt grass is Kimber is going to smother it, is the the point here. So um, anyway, back to uh, Tennessee in 1919. Um, like any uh, introduction, it it starts out slow uh, and then grows and grows and grows. So we're we're at the point where it's uh, uh, we need to flatten the curve, we'll say. Uh, so stilt grass uh, was introduced as a packing material in porcelain. Um, so, because it, it, it grows up, it's fairly tall, or it can be fairly tall, it, it uh, dries to a brown, uh, very spongy, brittle material. Um, so it was good for, for packing material. So it was probably, uh, someone received a, a, um, a shipment of porcelain and then threw the packing material out and it had seeds and that started our quest with, uh, with stilt grass. Stilt grass is an annual grass. You can see it, it looks like a grass. It's a monocot, so it's got the, the parallel veins. The leaves come are tapered to a point on both sides. They're fairly small. Um, it, they're not a long strap-shaped uh, leaf like a, like a lawn grass, so it looks fairly unique. Uh, one of the most unique characteristics of it, and I don't know, light has to be just right, uh, as it comes out, it's kind of curled, which leaves this shiny spot down the middle of the leaf. So that's very diagnostic of Japanese stilt grass. Uh, the other thing is that it's uh, because it's an annual, it pulls up very easily, and you can see the uh, the roots pull up very easily. I, people talk about these being stilt roots. Maybe that's where it gets the name from. Um, there's other things that look like stilt grass. Um, we have a big patch here of of uh, smartweed. Um, Smartweed is a dicot, so if you actually look at the leaves, you'll see that the veins do not run parallel. They come out, again, in a, a palmate fashion. Um, all smartweeds have this ocrea, this, this sheath uh, around where the leaves connect to the, um, the stem. Uh, so that is not, even though it's kind of a similar leaf shape, that is not stilt grass. Um, there's another grass that we'll have to put in later that uh, people confuse with stilt grass regularly. Um, white grass, uh, which has a longer leaf. It's, it's more pale, pale green than this, although this is fairly pale green. Um, uh, white grass is a perennial, so it's more firmly rooted um, than this. But our concern is that uh, Japanese stilt grass takes over. It covers an area. Um, you can find areas, uh, natural areas, good quality natural areas that have been completely overtaken by stilt grass. Uh, so it's a it's a scary thing. It doesn't the seeds appear to be fairly heavy. They don't they don't uh, they're not distributed by the wind. They're more distributed by um, by dogs running through it or deer running through it or people running through it. Um, we pick up the seeds. We spread it to other areas. Uh, the nice thing about that kind of seed dispersal is that it tends to be fairly um, confined. We have this patch of, of stilt grass right here, but 10 feet on either side of us, uh, we don't find it. So it makes it a little easier to control. It's, it stays in the area. Controlling it. If it can be, con because it's an annual, it can be controlled and it, and it pulls up very easily. It can be controlled by weeding. That's what we'll do if it's up in our, our garden beds or around the house. We'll just go ahead and, and pick it and um, uh, that, that will control it. And then we don't have to have uh, herbicides and things like that in the garden beds. Uh, last year uh, was our first year of really fighting stilt grass. Um, we had huge patches of it along our driveway. Uh, we tried just mowing it. If we mow it low so that there's a few leaves left, it seems like it's still 
flowers and produces seeds. So that didn't seem to work. Um, but we did go through with a weed whip and take it all the way down to the ground. And if we cut off all of the leaves and just left the roots in the ground, that seemed to kill it. It didn't come back this year. Um, I haven't seen any on our driveway after doing that. So that's a nice uh, low impact way of, of taking care of the, the stilt grass there. In a situation like this, it's really not practical for us to come out and weed everything that we see. So um, uh, we end up using an herbicide. And I understand some people are concerned about herbicides. Um, I'm concerned about herbicides too. Um, I'm more concerned about the fact that if we don't use herbicides, uh, it, it's going to be out of control and we're going to lose the native flora and fauna. So um, I'm, I'm willing to make that, uh, that move. Um, we've, we've tried several different herbicides. Um, we started off using uh, Roundup, not Roundup, but a glyphosate, um, an off-name uh, glyphosate. We buy it in two and a half gallon jugs, so it's relatively inexpensive. For a gallon of glyphosate, it's like 70 cents uh, and we can spray an area. To spray an area like this, glyphosate kills everything. So it would kill off, you know, we've got uh, spice bush here, we've got black snake root here, we've got uh, violets, we've got um, orange uh, jewelweed and ginger. All of that would be killed if we were using glyphosate. So that's not our goal. So we tried some other, other options. Um, I went out and I bought bottles of Grass Be Gone. Six dollars a bottle for a one pint bottle or something. It worked well, it killed the, the grass and it didn't kill other things. It did kill native grasses, but um, uh, it was better than the option, uh, but fairly expensive. Six dollars for a one pint bottle doesn't go very far. Uh, the active ingredient in, in Grass Be Gone is the same thing as Fusilod 2, which you can buy in a, a bigger concentrate and mix up. That's a lot more economical. Grass Be Gone works out to be about forty dollars a, a gallon, and I'll, I'll put all of this in notes uh, so people can see it that are interested. Um, but the Fusilod 2, you can buy in concentrate. It works out to be about, I think it's like $4 a, a gallon um, to make it up that way. Um, so that's one, one option. Um, we've started using Acclaim Extra, which is a plant that's, that's uh, actually, it's listed for um, stilt grass. It, uh, it, I believe it can be used in lawns, so it doesn't kill all grasses, it just kills some grasses, um, but it would also leave the forbs, forbs being uh, non-grass plants. Um, that's what we will probably use in this area. There is another product on the market called Milestone that sounds like it would be uh, an, an option. It's uh, listed, or, uh, or stilt grass is listed on its label as something that's controlled. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with it. We'll probably try some out. Uh, we'll create a video on uh, how do you, the, the difference between Milestone and Acclaim Extra and some of the other things um, and see which works out best. Um, Milestone is relatively cheap. It, uh, uh, the concentrate is like $140 for a quart, which is kind of expensive, but uh, it takes very little to make it up. So it ends up being about 30 cents a gallon to spray. Um, it's supposed to kill non-native uh, things like the uh, stilt grass and some other forbs, including um, Japanese honeysuckle and uh, some other things, and not impact native things. I don't understand quite how it can do, be so selective that it takes out non-native things uh, and leaves native things. Uh, it must uh, check for uh, residency or something like that. I'm not sure how that works out, but um, we'll, we'll look into that and, uh, and do some more information on that. So what we're going to do today is uh, spray this for um, with uh, the Acclaim Extra. It doesn't seem like it's going to be raining anytime soon, so we're going to go ahead and spray. The, uh, uh, the labels say it needs an hour or two hours of time to dry uh, before you need to worry about rain washing things off. Uh, so I hope we're going to be okay on that. If not, uh, we keep a log of when we've sprayed, how much we've sprayed, uh, and when it rained afterwards so we can keep track of uh, what's going on, what's working, and what's not working. Uh, one of the first things that I did uh, because we were going to be spraying was I put Kimber away. So Kimber is back at the house um, inside so that she's not going to be walking through this area. Um, the other thing is as I was walking back from putting Kimber away, I did pull up two plants. Uh, one is the smartweed that we were talking about. Um, this particular smartweed uh, is in bloom. So that makes it very obvious that it's not, um, here, I guess do it this way, um, stilt grass. Um, and then the other was the white grass, which uh, 
has a very pale leaf, which I guess is kind of like stilt grass, um, but much longer leaves. Um, but it, it tends to grow in the same kind of weedy habitats that you find the stilt grass. So we're going to uh, spray. Um, because we're spraying an aerosol, we're just, um, normally when we use herbicides, we're using it uh, glyphosate on cut stem things like um, honeysuckle or bittersweet. Um, and then I'm, I'm painting it directly on the stump. It's not getting up into the air very much. Um, I'm comfortable with just wearing gloves um, as enough of a protective, uh, uh, personal protective stuff. So, um, but because we're going to be spraying this out, um, I not only wear uh, rubberized gloves to keep it off my hands, um, but also a respirator. So in this day of COVID-19, everybody's talking about respirators. Um, a cloth mask does not work for protecting you from chemical sprays. So this respirator has cartridges in it that are designed for uh, chemical work. Um, this is, uh, it's organic vapor is what it protects against. So th this will, will fit better and be a better protection against um, anything that gets out into the air. You know, a good rule of thumb is if I can smell it, it's not working very well. So we'll see how that goes. Um, the, uh, we've mixed up the uh, Acclaim Extra. It's at its lowest concentration, which is um, 0.3 ounces per gallon. Um, this is two gallons, so we use 0.6 ounces, which uh, because I use a, a syringe to measure out small amounts like that, it was uh, 18 milliliters. Uh, and then I added a red dye to it, so I know where I've sprayed and where I haven't sprayed. Uh, makes it a lot easier. The red dye doesn't last very long, uh, so it, uh, it's not going to leave a big uh, stain on the ground. Um, we're going to spray things off. I'm going to put the blue pin flags around dated with when we sprayed. It'll mark off the area. It'll show us the extent of what it was. Uh, we can come back. I'm putting a, a blue flag up in the tree so that we can see it from a distance. We can come back out here. Uh, we'll probably draw it on a map that we keep uh, in the house uh, where we've sprayed. So we'll come back in a couple weeks, look and make sure that it's killed everything, look and evaluate how it's done as far as uh, whether it's had much of an impact on the native plant community, um, and if we've missed anything, because it, it could be that as we're spraying, particularly with uh, so much else on the uh, forest floor, that you know this ash tree here will block off some spray so that there will be stilt grass underneath it that won't get sprayed, uh, so we'll need to spray it again. Uh, so it's June, whatever it is, June, fourth or third or something. So beginning of June, um, it's going to be a long time before the stilt grass blooms because it doesn't bloom until fall. Uh, the, the goal is we want to kill it before it blooms. Again, it's an annual. Our goal is to reduce the seed population. So if we kill it now, uh, it will be dead well before it will produce seeds. So we're going to go ahead and um, get set up to spray. So whenever spraying an area like this, I have a tendency to start at the worst area and then spread out. And then I find myself walking through areas that I sprayed, which is not a good idea. So it's better to start at the outskirts, hit the, the small stuff, and work my way methodically through an area um, so that I don't have to walk through it. So we're going to sign off here. We don't have enough per personal protective equipment for uh, Julie, and this is obviously not something we want her to be exposed to when she's uh, filming this. So she's going to take off while I finish up here. Thanks again for watching. Um, hopefully this will encourage you to uh, look for the Japanese stilt grass um, and do some, uh, take some effort to try to control it. Um, if you do, let me know. Make a comment in the comments. Uh, if you've got any questions, um, again, We'll try to answer them in the comments section, um, but we appreciate you uh, trying to take control over, uh, over the natural areas and uh, try to do some, some good. So thanks, thanks very much for watching.